I know why we never return to the moon. After I posted my last part of this story, I thought it'd be done with this. I really did. But I guess it doesn't really work that way, does it? Uh, how do I even start? The last week or so was, well, qu quite dramatic. I might need to break this up into a few posts to explain it in detail, so I apologize for any cliffhangers it might turn into. Anyway, this is what happened. I woke up in my home on the floor with a pounding headache. I confusingly stood up and took my phone out of my pocket to see what time it was. The battery was dead. I awkwardly walked into my bedroom and plugged my phone into the charger. As I glanced out of my window, I noticed that it was still dark outside, but the first rays of sunlight were slowly climbing above the horizon. What a night, I thought. I didn't usually drink much, but a terrible hangover was the only explanation to my current situation. It wouldn't have been the first one anyway. Suddenly, a loud banging on my door brought me to full awareness, and I realized that it was probably also the reason I woke up. Miller! Miller! Are you there? The visitor yelled. I literally had no clue what was going on. In fact, I had no clue what I had done that night. It was a completely blank spot in my head. I grabbed a kitchen knife and carefully opened the door. Who the hell are you and what do you want? I asked the visitor, whom I had not seen once in my life but apparently he knew who I was. What? Oh fuck, you found it, didn't you? I told you not to, you idiot! I fucking told you to let it go! I shouldn't have told you anything in the first place! Christ! You don't even know what the hell I'm talking about now, the man said. As I said, I had never seen this man in my life, but on second thought, his voice sounded familiar, but it took me a second to realize who he was. The same man who mailed me the confidential material I posted in the second part of the story. Pearson. Listen, kid. I know you're confused, but you have to trust me. You're not safe, or not after what you did. You need to come with me, he said. I hesitated for a few seconds, and then turned to head back inside to collect my things. Pearson grabbed my arm. Leave your stuff as it is. We need to get out of here, right now. You should thank God or whatever you believe in that they didn't find you yet. He exclaimed as he pulled me towards his car. The tires squealed as we sped off into the night. Who's trying to find me? What the fuck is going on? I demanded an answer, as I was trying to somewhat comprehend what just happened. Listen, it's too much to explain right now. Try not to think too much, and... And don't try to recall what you did tonight, Pearson answered. I noticed that he was often looking at the sides and behind the car, as if he was trying to see if someone or something was following us. Of course... I did exactly what he told me not to do. I reached into my mind and tried to piece together any fragments of this night. A series of incomprehensible images started flashing in front of my eyes. The last thing I remember was Pearson slamming the pedal to the floor. I passed out. I woke up in a small gray room filled with a handful of medical equipment. I was immediately reassured to be awake. Actually, I was reassured that everything I had just experienced was just a dream, but then I realized that not all of it was. I looked around to survey my surroundings. The paint on the walls was old and dirty. The ceiling was supported by steel beams with early signs of corrosion. There were no windows anywhere in sight. I stood up and almost collapsed again. My head was still aching. I walked out of the room and entered a long, dimly lit corridor. There was a heavy steel door on both ends and many smaller doors on the sides. One of them was open leaking just a tiny bit more light into the corridor. I slowly approached. The room looked like some sort of command center. Loads of not exactly new electrical equipment, radios, monitors, computers, etc. There was a large table in the center. Pearson was standing right next to the table, seemingly examining some sort of map, but after a closer look, he was more, he was more likely lost in deep thought than actually paying attention to the map. Pearson? I announced my presence pulling him back into reality. You're awake. How do you feel, kid? You might want to take it a bit slower. T take a seat here. I'll explain what I can. I obliged. Where are we? I asked. Someplace safe. Deep enough underground that they won't find us anytime soon. You need to tell me what's going on, dude. I insisted. Just let me talk. I'm trying to. 
he replied. Last night, you called me and said that you had somehow found another message on your grandfather's note. You talked about something called the key, and that you burned the message. At least that's one thing you did, right? I told you not to do anything and wait for me, but when I had arrived at your home, you were already done. You remember any of that? No, just what happened after you arrived? Who are we running from? From them, he said, and pointed at a picture of the night sky with a full moon taped on a wall. I looked at it for a moment, at first not understanding, then wondering if this guy was serious. No, that's not possible. I thought that it was all made up. I, I, I refuse to believe that. Look, if this is some kind of prank, it's really not funny anymore. It's not a prank, and I don't care if you believe me or not. You're miles deep in this now, either way, since you didn't fucking listen to what I told you. <sighs> I know this will probably sound a bit crazy, but from what we know, the moon is some kind of extrasolar object. It's been dormant for eons, but it's not anymore. Its inhabitants aren't, at least. They're searching for something here, on Earth. They've been here for a few years. They've been here for a few years at least. Last night, you found it, he continued. How do you know all this? I asked. You're not, you're not the first one to find the key, obviously, since your grandfather wrote about it. An awful lot of people tried to keep it hidden, but it's almost as if it had a mind of its own. It never works, at least not forever. What Pearson was saying made sense in a way, but really, just in a way. One part of me still didn't want to believe him. And the other one wanted to know everything. So why can't I remember it? I asked. You know, it's not easy to explain, but it does things to people. The key, I mean. It can mess you up really good. What do you mean? What does it do? Now you're asking questions I can't answer. All I can say for sure is that it somehow gets inside your head. In the best case, it just mixes up a few things here and there. In the worst case, you completely lose your shit. So, I guess you're one of the better cases. After he said that, he paused for a while, as if thinking what to say next, or perhaps how to say it. At least I had a few seconds to process all of this new information. Now, as I said, they'll do everything they can to find the key. That mustn't happen. Never. Do you understand? They must not get the key. If they do, well, <laughs> bad things are going to happen. What, exactly? He looked me in the eyes and then glanced away. I'm afraid I can't tell you anything more, he answered as he stared into the empty space. Can't or won't, I thought to myself. But honestly, I was unable to listen to this anymore. I had to take a break. Pearson showed me around the bunker, as he called it. And there was a couple of bedrooms, an infirmary, a small kitchen, sort of living room, and a few administrative storage rooms. This door leads to the surface, he said after we finished the tour. Whatever you do, don't try to open it. It's locked anyway, so you won't be able to, but most of all, don't open the old door in the back. He continued, and glanced at the old heavy rusty door at the end of the corridor. It leads to decommissioned areas of the bunker. It's not safe, he added a few moments later, just as I was about to elaborate. I walked into the kitchen and opened a can of soup. I later decided to try and put on some crappy movie on the TV in the common room to drive away my thoughts. It didn't work. I couldn't stop thinking about everything that had happened recently. And I eventually managed to fall asleep. I had the same dream again that night, but I continued further than the last day. I was in front of the cave once again, but this time, I didn't wake up. I went inside. I don't know how long I roamed the underground tunnels. The cave was completely silent, unnaturally silent. No drips of water, no whistling of the wind flapping of bat wings or even my own echo. Nothing. Just dead silence. Then I reached a circular chamber. It also seemed unnatural. The walls were made out of rocky deposits and other cavernous formations, but the chamber was too round, too symmetrical to appear natural. There was something in the center, a black object, wrapped with layers of rock and sediments. The perfect sphere. I woke up, Realizing I had no way of telling how much time had passed since Pearson brought me to the bunker. I've never been claustrophobic, but I had to admit that the complete lack of windows or any information from me outside was taking its toll. It made me think. Pearson was really the only person I've been able to talk to since yesterday. He could easily be misleading or using me, since I've been basically locked inside. 
I'd have no way to escape in case things really went south. Could I trust him? I guess I had to. Only time would tell what his real intentions were. But my biggest question was, what was really behind the old steel door? You're finally awake, huh? Pearson interrupted my series of thoughts. I hope you're feeling better now, because we have a lot of work to do.